So our today's lecture is on proton radiotherapy. Um, I am sure it will be very interesting to learn for all of us since uh, here at Stanford we don't have proton machines yet, though soon we will be getting a first in the world Mavian 250 fit system uh, with patients sitting in the upright position in the chair during treatment and Sardar will speak about that a little bit more. So our speaker is Dr. Sardar Chariev. Uh, he's originally from Turkmenistan. He came to US to study um, at Georgia Tech, and then he switched to medical physics during the residency at Emory, uh, where they do offer proton therapy. Uh, and that's where he learned everything about protons. And so after graduation, he was hired here uh, at Stanford. He is now part of our team. Uh, he works here as a clinical assistant professor. And together with Yon Yang, uh, he's working on the Proton project for uh, commissioning of the Mavian machine, including the vault design, shielding, installation, accept acceptance and commissioning. Uh, so we are very eager to hear you talk, Sardar. Uh, please take it away. I will stop sharing. Can you see my screen well? Yes. Okay, thank you, Natalia, for the introduction. So I'll try to fit all of the uh, things, <clears throat> more, 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 most of the things about protons. That's why I named this as uh, all things protons in this uh, hopefully one hour lecture. Uh, here's the uh, kind of uh, overview of what uh, I will talk today. First, I'll start with the rationale and uh, uh, clinical perspective for protons, and, and then briefly about the uh, overview of the physics, followed by the uh, short mention of radiobiology, then we'll switch to delivery technologies, uh, treatment planning, and then I will conclude with the imaging with uh, protons. So let's start with the uh, rationale for protons. <clears throat> So why is this excitement uh, for protons? Perhaps all of you have seen this or similar figure. Uh, protons have negligible dose deposition in the uh, distal end of the tumor. They have uh, higher relative biological effectiveness and they have better ability to shape the uh, radiation dose to conform the tumor shape. So in theory, uh, these uh, physical and dosimetric advantages translate to uh, reduced normal tissue dose, uh, meaning reduced probable secondary malignancy. This gives a chance for uh, dose escalation and better OER uh, constraints. So in the era of evidence-based medicine, uh, does this dosimetric advantage actually translate into detectable and meaningful patient gains? So let's talk a little bit about that. So as you might be aware, one group of patients for which there is little or no controversy about the role of the proton beam is uh, pediatric cancers, and perhaps the very best indication for protons. And uh, this is due to the uh, children being uh, uniquely uh, sensitive to radiation. For one, there will be profound effects of radiation on organ growth and function from uh, growth, growth retardation to endocrine development and cognitive development. And keep in mind, uh, most pediatric cancers are uh, now cured, and most children will live with these consequences to the rest of their lives. For two, uh, there is a higher risk of radiation-induced uh, secondary cancer, and anything we can do to not only minimize the dose that we give, but also the volume that we treat is greatly appreciated by children and by the physicians. So we see this uh, iconic images again and again, probably for a reason they speak the case for protons. Um, here first, in the first uh, picture here, you see uh, craniospinal irradiation of a spine of a child with uh, medulloblastoma. A uh, photon beam, as you can see, is exiting through the developing heart, developing lung, and developing gut. Photon beam is, however, restricted to the spine. In the middle here is the comparison of dosimetry of protons and uh, IMRT for pediatric rhabdomyosarcoma. 
coverage is uh, more conformal and then there is a less integral dose as compared to this plan. And the last column is the similar to symmetric characteristic for pediatric brain tumors. While almost every proton plan will look dosimetrically superior to an equivalent photon plan due, it, due to its physical properties, the potential clinical benefit in adults may not be as large as it may be for children. If there were no cost differences, radiation oncologists would likely use techniques they feel most comfortable to minimize the dose to the normal tissue and the, the one that best conforms the high dose. So for the following scenarios, cases that I will talk, the protons have shown somewhat equivalent or somewhat better outcome. So here we can see <clears throat> ocular uh, melanoma case. Uh, so the option, what is the treatment option? So surgical enucleation. Well, removal of the eye should be avoided if possible at all costs. So what are my other options? So I, I uh, uh, plaque brachytherapy and external beam with photons and protons. And this work shows that ocular melanomas can be equally treated with either protons or eye plaque brachii, and the preference will depend on uh, the availability, expertise, uh, location of the tumor, and the applicator size. Another example is uh, chordomas and chondrosarcomas. They are very radio resistant. They are often uh, near uh, critical neurologic structures, making it really difficult to fully resect. Uh, with conventional IMRT, we often need to undertreat the tumor because of uh, normal tissue dose constraints. And appropriate management for these uh, consists of the maximal safe resection, followed by the uh, post-op dose escalated radiation therapy. So proton therapy uh, is often used to maximize the uh, sparing of the organ risk, such as the brainstem and optical apparatus, at the same time delivering the uh, that dose escalated uh, treatment. So this meta-analysis here shows that overall survival of 3, 5, and 10 years, you can see that they were able to identify improvement in overall survival because they could deliver that escalated dose to the tumor. Head and neck cancers, they can involve tonsils, uh, base of tongue, larynx, and radiation is used in combination with chemotherapy to definitively cure these. As you can imagine, this can be very toxic can have a lot of side effects, uh, very uh, radiosensitive area. Obviously, being able to eat to get, to get your nutrition can be uh, challenging. So with the protons, you can treat with uh, posterior obliques and spare uh, the front of the mouth. The study here done by Manzar et al. looked at over 300 patients comparing intensity modulated proton therapy to VMAT. They reported less hospitalization, uh, decreased pain uh, requirement, decreased requirement for use of the narcotic pain medicine, and uh, decreased mucositis. And they reported also improved swallow. Another particular area where we can <clears throat> benefit from protons is really irradiation. This is the scenario where a patient has already received a full course of uh, radiation therapy. And now uh, they present with a local regional recurrence or secondary pr primary cancer. Historically, uh, re irradiation has not been highly used due to risk of uh, severe toxicity. Now, with the modern and conformal radiation techniques like protons, uh, we are better suited for uh, re irradiation. So, uh, on the right, that you can see these two cases where we can use proton fields strategically to spare uh, critical organs so much so that protons can render some of the candidates uh, treatable again who were previously not candidate for uh, definitive therapy. So just to give you an example of a couple of studies, the first one on the top here is a study that came out of MSK. They were looking at 242 head and neck patients treated with uh, proton re-radiation. Re uh, they treated to full dose of 70 gray and their one-year local control was 72%, and one-year overall survival was 53%. The second study in the middle, it looked at proton radiation of 46 recurrent or new primary breast cancer patients in the setting of prior RT. So the cumulative dose is very high at 110 uh, gray, and the uh, disease control rate was excellent uh, with a two-year distant metastasis-free survival of 92%, and overall survival of 94%. 
And this last study here uh, look at uh, 18 uh, patients with the recur recurrent GI cancer. It's a smaller study, but uh, very high cumulative doses at triple digits. Uh, and one year local control was at uh, 75%. So uh, quick uh, question here. Um, question one, uh, what is the rationale uh, for proton therapy? No exit dose, uh, less integral dose, higher relative biological effectiveness, opportunity for dose escalation, or all of the above. Yeah, so majority answered this correctly. So it is uh, all of the above. So let's uh, move on with the overview of uh, physics. <clears throat> so this is a kind of a comparison of protons to other ionizing radiation in terms of uh, nature of the particle. Proton um, is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Um, it carries a unit positive charge and has mass of about 2,000 times of that an electron. It's uh, directly ionizing. And other fun facts, it's a fundamental uh, particle of nature. Most stable particle consists of three quarks, two up and down, and, and one down. You can see that the classic depth dose curve of these ionizing radiation together uh, in the same graph, so electrons, photons, proton, and carbon ion. So the clinical argument from here is the proton therapy depth dose curve is suitable so that there is no or negligible dose beyond a certain depth, right? And alongside with that higher elevated uh, biological effectiveness, it makes the protons a uh, more attractive candidate for therapy. So let's briefly talk about how come protons have that depth dose curve. So what are the interactions that are responsible for this? So first, inelastic Coulomb interactions with the atomic electrons. Uh, look at A here. That's the uh, kind of dominating interaction that can be approximated by continuous slowing down because proton lose a small fraction of energy to electron at each interaction. Uh, these interactions are important for cancer kill because electrons are the ones who deposit the energy locally. And second is, uh, at B here, is the elastic Coulomb scattering with atomic nuclei. This is responsible for something known as multiple Coulomb scattering. So protons will make that small scattering without considerable energy loss and knowing that um, usually nuclei have mass greater than the incoming particle, the energy transfer is negligible, but each scattering adds a small angle deviation to the incoming proton ter uh, proton's trajectory. So with this, even though this deflection is very small, all the deflection adds up and contributes to that not so straight path of the protons inside a medium. And the third here is inelastic and nuclear interaction. Uh, these produce neutrons. So because of that, uh, some of the fluence will be lost due to this uh, and before the protons can even reach the uh, Bragg peak. So speaking of Bragg peak, uh, let's open this uh, concept a little bit more and uh, let's look at this inelastic Coulomb interaction to better understand this. So with this uh, interaction type, protons can cause excitation, meaning electrons are excited to a higher energy level or ionization uh, electrons escape from the atom. The mean energy transfer to electrons are, as we said, very low simply because the mass of the proton is very large as compared to mass of the electron. And interaction probability is inversely, inversely proportional to proton energy. So how does a proton dissipate its energy into ionizing radiation? Well, you know, it's kind of governed by this equation here called Beth Bloch equation. And then this DEDX here is stopping power, basically linear energy transfer. So some of the implications of this equation are for a given medium, it depends on the particle velocity in charge. The stopping power is proportional to the Z square and inversely proportional to the V square. So ions with higher charge or lower speed lose energy faster, therefore losing bigger portion of their energy towards the end of their range, therefore the peak of that brag. So 
here's the uh, central axis depth dose distribution for unmodulated 250 MeV proton beam, showing a narrow uh, Bragg peak. As protons travel through a medium, their velocity is reduced. As this happens, the probability that a proton will interact increases. The result of this is that the dose to position from a proton beam is concentrated near the end of their path. Of course, this uh, Bragg peak is not useful to treat uh, 3D tumors. It's uh, very narrow, right? So multiple uh, pristine uh, Bragg peaks can be combined as such to form what is known spread out Bragg peak or SOBP. So there are, as you can see here in this illustration, seven energy layers, and the individual weight of this each energy layer uh, can be uh, play with uh, so that you end up with um, flat SOBP. So a little exercise here. Here I show a change of fluence dash line and the dose solid line with depth. <clears throat> uh, this is for photon. So if we were asked to draw the same thing for proton, it would li look like something like this. So kind of point out some of the uh, similarities or differences. You can see uh, the attenuation um, for photons. So you can see the fluence is being attenuated, it's decreasing. Uh, for photons, no substantial change in a photon energy spectrum and no substantial change in electron energy spectrum from Compton scattering. So no substantial change in ion pairs per unit length and no substantial change in ratio between the biological dose and physical dose. For protons, uh, there is no attenuation, well, virtually no attenuation there is, but no attenuation of fluence stays almost constant near until the end where it uh, goes down. And then particle loses the energy gradually, energy loss per, per ion uh, stays the same, and ion pairs per unit length increases. So this increases in the linear energy transfer and possibly the ratio between biological dose and physical dose. Therefore, increase in that RBE. So this affluence actually is not this flat. Uh, it, it will uh, decrease uh, because of the nuclear interactions. And probably my next question is uh, to kind of assess that. I didn't talk about this, but I kind of wanted to give this question so that uh, people have idea of how much uh, that inelastic proton interaction with nucleus uh, uh, will uh, result in loss of proton fluence. So yeah, so as, as, as I expected, there are a lot of different answers and this is a good thing because we are just guessing here. So majority said it's 0.1% per cm of all protons. Uh, actually it is, uh, 1% per cm of all protons. So as you can see uh, from this 2002 publication by Paganetti, uh, the protons go about 20 cm the range, and you can see that they drop from 100% to about 80%, so giving that 1% per cm for all protons. So yes, we will lose some of our fluence of protons. So not going into much detail, let's uh, talk about a little bit about uh, proton radiobiology. So first of all, what is uh, relative biological effectiveness or RBE? So the proton RBE is the ratio of the absorbed dose um, to that that produces the same biological effect or clinical endpoint X between a reference radiation and the proton beam radiation under otherwise the same conditions. So it kind of alludes to this uh, equation and also visualized with this graph here. So in this equation, the equivalent proton and reference radiation dose are an implicit function of many physical, biological, and treatment parameters, including the fraction size, the total treatment dose, dose rate, and proton beam properties. Also, it is uh, important to note that the concept of RBE, which is a measure of relative rather than absolute biological response, will vary from endpoint to endpoint. So, for example, are you talking about cell survival or are you talking about some other clinical endpoints? So RBE will be different. 
So it's currently recommended by the ICRU that the RBE weighted dose be defined as the product of absorbed dose, absorbed physical dose, and RBE. Uh, and the unit should be gray RBE. So the proton treatments are currently planned and delivered, assuming a constant proton RBE of 1.1, meaning that uh, a given proton absorbed dose is assumed to be equivalent to 10% higher photon absorbed dose. So this value was deduced as an average value. Um, and this was, again, dates back to 1970s for uh, in vivo studies from those dates. And note that this is the uh, average value and reported for A, the center of the target volume B for two gray fraction size and C, average over all endpoints. So if you look at actual RBE, for example, from this graph, and again, this probably is representative of some model, but for specifically this model, at the entrance, the RBE is 1.1. At the center of the SOBP is 1.15, distal edge 1.35, and distal fall off is as high as 1.7. So the question is, why don't we use 1.15 instead of 1.1? One should um, realize that this 1.1 was selected uh, and as advised by TG256 as a conservative estimate. So it's, it's at least ensures that we're not underdosing. So, uh, okay, let's continue with the proton beam delivery technologies. So here uh, I show two uh, accelerators. So one of them is a cyclotron here on the left. It's a, it's a cyclic accelerator for which uh, the uh, electric field is alternated as the magnetic field is kept constant. The electric field is varied as a square wave with constant frequency changing uh, the sign of the field while keeping the magnetic field uh, constant. So these are called Ds. These are uh, hollow electrodes and are kept under vacuum between magnetic upper and lower poles. The particle starts at zero at the center here and kind of spirals outwards, gaining energy as they are accelerated by this rapid uh, voltage switches in between the Ds. So the maximum energy uh, that's, um, that proton can get is defined by the diameter of the revolution of protons. And typically that's the diameter of the cyclotron. And for protons, it is three to five meters. And Protons that exit from here then are monoenergetic. So the range here is modulated at the ex exit of this uh, cyclotron using some degraders. Uh, this advantage of this is uh, the greater uh, neutron contamination. So the next is uh, on the right is the uh, synchrotron. So it's also a cycle accelerator for which the magnetic field and electric field are kind of synchronously uh, changed with the particle beam. Um, the synchrotrons are commonly used in conjunction with the linear uh, accelerator. The linear accelerator provides the particle a high speed while synchrotron kind of acts as a booster to accelerate the proton to its final energy. Synchrotrons cannot accelerate particle from the rest because both electric and magnetic fields are varied. This accelerator can achieve much higher energies as compared to the cyclotrons. And uh, synchrotrons produce uh, pulse beam because of the time required to cycle those uh, magnets. Typical diameter for a synchrotron is about eight to 10 meters for protons. So here you can see a uh, kind of a layout for a five room proton center. Here you can see a, that superconducting cyclotron. So that, that D-shaped uh, accelerator. And then the beam comes out in the beam line here. Somewhere along here or there, we'll have energy selection system using the graders. And then after that, the beam goes into corresponding rooms. So here we have four rooms that have gantries. And we have one room here with the fixed beam. Uh, and then uh, the beam will be delivered to the room that requested it first, meaning that when one room is treating, the other room should be waiting in two. So you cannot be getting the proton beam at the same time. Uh, the, of course, the proton centers with multiple rooms, uh, they evolve and are very good as kind of uh, harmoniously dancing where 
one beam is treating, the second one is uh, imaging, the third one is kind of prepping, setting up the patient, and the other room is uh, changing patients. So it kind of increases the efficiency. But yeah, uh, everyone cannot be treating at the same time. And you can see the scale of uh, this type of facility is pretty big. So kind of zoom in into one of these rooms here, and you can see that this gantry is very huge. Uh, patient does not see this. It's kind of behind this wall here, and patient is positioned on this six degree of freedom robotic arm couch. And then therapist can stand here and uh, image. Uh, there's a lead glass here. And after they are happy with the image, they can exit out of the room and do the treatment. As you can see, there's this gantry allows to rotate this uh, last panel imagers. And there's here on the ground orthogonal to that is the uh, X-ray source. And the gantry rotating allows you to do the uh, uh, 3D uh, volumetric imaging, EBCT and um, orthogonal imaging at the same time. And then once we are happy with the imaging, therapists will search the room and then they will exit out of the room and do the treatment. So this nozzle here is where a lot of things happen. So I'd like to kind of zoom in more into this nozzle and tell a little bit about this. So this nozzle can modulate beams depending on their design. So we have either double scattering design, pencil beam, or uniform scanning. So I kind of showed them here. In double scattering delivery system, as the name implies, we have two scatterers spread the beam. The first one, uh, the scatter widens that Gaussian-shaped beam laterally, and then the second uh, scatter further broadens the beam and flatness uh, in the radial intensity profile for the therapeutic use. Several me methods can modulate the penetration of the beam to create an SOBP, such as using the uh, uh, ridge filter or uh, range modulation wheel. So the dose conformity to the target uh, is performed or achieved with the aperture. Uh, sometimes called blocks, and the range compensator, sometimes called boluses. Methods involving the scanning of the beam is called pencil beam scanning. It can be further categorized as spot scanning, where dose is deposited in one location, then the beam turns off, moves to the next location, turns on the beam again, then re irradiate that location. Raster scanning is where is another form of pencil beam scanning where the beam is not turned off but continuously sweeping. And one advantage of the PBS design is, uh, among many, of course, is the, the less scatter radiation. So the primary uh, beam, uh, there is no, like, there is nothing, almost nothing in the beam's path. So there is very little uh, neutron production. Most of the neutron production happens at the energy selection, which is like right at the exit of the uh, cyclotron anyway. Then there is a uniform scanning. Uh, they, sh they share uh, the same concept from some concept from scattering and the PBS. Uh, rather than using a physical scatter to spread uh, the beam laterally, uniform scanning use scanning magnets and their optics to do that. Some of them may use one, one scatter only and achieve the rest with the uh, magnetic optics alone. So the question is how much this type of system costs? Um, and here's uh, some unwanted publicity from Wall Street Journal. Um, um, and there are such, such there's so many, uh, many articles of this nature in popular press. Uh, and then there is nothing in medicine, no other medical device as expensive as cyclotron. A four room proton system can cost about 200 million. Uh, and this is, I think from 2000, early 15, right? So sure, you can build hospital wings for $200 million, probably can cost you around that, but there's no medical device that comes even close. There's a single room solution uh, for a proton therapy system. Even that can cost you around $30 million. What I mean by single room here is more compact cyclotron with uh, gantries not making full 360 degree rotation. And then there is even more compact version or solution, as you might have heard, and Natalia put this nicely in the beginning. Um, so for example, here, uh, the S250 FIT proton therapy system from Mavion uh, Medical System, 
It's the uh, uh, smallest self-shielded proton uh, cyclotron. You can see this is kind of a beam's eye view from the top. Uh, here's the cyclotron, and this is supposed to be uh, Linac bolt. Um, and it has a patient positioning system that will treat upright. So if you look at from the side, so this is the patient positioner. And in a way, this is a, a paradigm change for us. Of course, uh, to complement this, there is a dual energy uh, wide bore uh, diagnostic CT that also scans in upright position. So yes, Stanford is getting one of these. The fitting in a LINAC bolt, this could be a more affordable and accessible option. So yes, proton therapy is very expensive, yet we are betting on proton therapy nonetheless. Looking at this graph, which shows you operating uh, particle facilities with most of them being proton centers around the globe, this goes as late as 2019, where when there were 115 centers operational. Currently, as we speak in 2023, there are 128 facilities in operation with 68 more under construction or planning stage. So how about the treatment planning here? I will uh, briefly touch on uh, treatment planning with uh, pencil beam because this is the uh, most, uh, most of the proton center now employ pencil beam, the double scattering, they are dying species. So I will focus on this. But before we go into planning, perhaps it would be beneficial to mention briefly explain proton range uncertainty. For protons, there is a concept of range uncertainty in the order of two and a half to three and a half percent of the actual range. So this may translate to 3.5 millimeter at a range of 10 cm or seven millimeter at a range of 20 cm. So really it depends on depth. And this mainly arises from uh, CT CTHU to stopping power ratio conversion. That's a big chunk of it, but obviously there are other culprits. Each institution may use different value, as you can see, depending on their own calibration, but most of them are in that given range. And if there's a tissue heterogeneity, it will degrade the BRAC peak and will add another uncertainty. And in this study on the right, it was shown that the heterogeneity may also affect the distal fall off of the, uh, uh, that uh, depth dose curve of the protons. So what do we do to account for this range uncertainty and plus the setup uncertainty? Like everyone else, we use margin. In photon, we know the uncertainty in the direction of the beam has minimal effect, remember, in where square law. Um, therefore, our margin is primarily to account for lateral uncertainties and when you do that for multiple beams or for modern arc type of uh, arc therapies like IMRT or VMAT, then you end up with the isotropic expansion around your uh, CTV. For protons, uh, the uh, lateral margin is similar concept to photon, even though uh, lateral penumbra may differ, but you know it's the same idea. In the depth direction, however, we do have to consider the range uncertainty because the actual depth of the proton beam can be shallower or it can be deeper. So we need a proximal margin and distal margin. So deeper the target, larger the margin. This expansion are beam and angle specific, hence the name beam specific PTV or BSPTV. So a little more about this beam specific PTV. The beam-specific PTV is based on water equivalent thickness, WET, ray tracing, and that accounts for range uncertainties calculated at the distal and proximal surface. Um, they will account for patient setup error and organ motion. The property of the BSPTV are angle dependent, beam angle dependent. They uh, depend on their surrounding tissue uh, of your uh, CTV and the shape can not can, can be unintuitive, not very intuitive. It can be weird to shape. It's not like uh, like a isotropic type of expansion. And most current commercial proton planning systems can generate beam specific uh, automatically. So here's an example for lung case for a cyan color CTV here. You can see the range, uh, range uncertainty plus the setup uncertainty are angle dependent and not very nice shape, not very intuitive. So once I have 
uh, my beam specific PTV, am I guaranteed to have a robust plan? And not necessarily. So what is another way to approach uh, the proton planning? There's a concept of uh, plan robustness in which we ask what happens to my dose distribution if my patient shifts in some direction on top of my range uncertainty. So during the optimization, you ask the optimizer to account for setup shift plus range uncertainty given a certain CTV. Then in the robust evaluation, you are given simulated dose for scenarios like this, for example, we have 12 scenarios here uh, with different shifts and with different uncertainty. And there is a DDH band corresponding to uh, this. So like a for OAR and for your uh, CTV. So you your, your plan should pass the cri your criteria for the worst case. In this sense, you can see that we even have a CTV-based planning rather than PTV-based planning in the PBS. So switching gears a little bit, I would like to introduce uh, or touch upon two basic uh, planning techniques, SFO and MFO. SFO stands for single field optimization. In this technique, each field is optimized independently of other fields. In other words, single field should be adequate to ensure the plan metrics in giving the uniform dose. MFO stands for multi-field optimization, and in this technique, all the fields work together, and the optimizer works to achieve uniform total dose, but each field can have non-uniform dose. So this is kind of showing the SFO and the bottom showing the uh, MFO. In the intensity modulated proton treatment planning, we often need to split the target, as you can see, for this head and neck plan. The same applies for, for example, prostate treatment, including the uh, uh, lymph nodes. Uh, in that case, uh, the plan will be MFO by design because you are splitting the target. So in general, the uh, SFO is more robust than MFO. So if something happens to one of the field in the MFO, this doesn't happen in the SFO because each of them is independent of the other field. Uh, MFO can spare normal tissue better for more complicated target cases. And that's one of the reasons why we split that target because we want to do something that target specific. Um, we use SFO if possible for convex shaped targets. SFO is usually pretty good. For MFO, we use it based on the need, uh, the uh, head and neck type of tumors, uh, prostate plus uh, the uh, lymph node will need this type of uh, MFO uh, planning. Um, and if the, any OAR is surrounded by the target and uh, if we need to split the field. So proton planning, uh, we need to also keep in mind that we are uh, very dependent on the anatomy changes here. Uh, it's kind of illustrate this concept are uh, two scenarios where I have for example, lower density proximal to the target. So what happens in this scenario is your depth dose curve kind of is shifted deeper, meaning that you are overdosing the distal OAR here and you are underdosing the proximal target here. But if you increase a higher density proximal to the target, let's say as such, instead of air, then you have what's known as pullback. So your depth dose is now shallower, meaning that you are underdosing your distal target and you are overdosing the proximal OAR. So this is challenging in uh, the practice of proton therapy. And the question is what to do for this is the adaptive RT. So what we do is we frequently rescan and replan in the proton world. So there will be routine uh, quality CT scans for patients, even without any indications, to see how much we are uh, deviating from the original plan. And if necessary, we will replan it. As you might imagine, this is very resource intensive, and uh, sometimes patients may not get the optimal treatment. So question number three is then, which one is wrong regarding uh, beam-specific PTV?
B-manual dependence, that is five plan robustness affected by surrounding tissue density. Shape can be not intuitive. Ooh. So yeah, this is interesting. Uh, yeah, so we said that uh, the beam specific PTV is beam angle dependent. That's where it derives its name. Um, it's affected by surrounding tissue density and uh, the shapes are not intuitive. So the correct answer here should be uh, satisfies uh, plan robustness. It does not satisfy the plan robustness. Okay, this is the last section of my talk, hopefully to leave you some time for questions. And I wanted to mention this because this becoming, the imaging with protons becoming mainstream. So uh, I, I, I used abbreviation here, PRG stands for proton radiography and PCT stands for uh, proton computer tomography. So PRG and PCT uh, have a long history. Uh, the first proposal of the concept dates back to 1962, so over 60 years of history. Yet, we do not have a commercially available system. So, few manufacturers actually offer clinical imaging system that's suitable for proton radiography, but none for proton uh, tomography yet. So, as you can see, their reach to the clinic has been kind of slow. In fact, it turns out that the use of protons instead of X-rays for transmission imaging has some disadvantages, right? So to begin with, the equipment is very expensive. We need cyclotron or cyclotron to produce out the uh, uh, high energy proton beam. And the image quality uh, because of the multiple Coulomb scattering is not good, it's bad. So then the natural question is then why bother, right? Well, there are some advantages. For example, for proton radiography, this will allow us for beam's eye view imaging with the particle used for treatment. And this leads to a valuable alternative to orthogonal X-rays for position verification. And this also means direct validation of the target in the treatment field. The primary motivation though for proton uh, therapy planning, if we can realize proton computer tomography, then the energy loss by the proton as they pass through the patient can tell us about proton stopping power inside the patient. And this is something that X-rays cannot provide directly. So to better understand this, uh, let's do a little exercise again. So we need the material information along the beam's path to be accurate. And let's see why, right? So let's say for photon, you your tumor is at 10 cm here. It sees, or six MV photon beam sees 67% uh, percent of the maximum dose. If something unanticipated is on the way, like bone, for example, and now you need to pull this PDD by 1 cm, let's say, and your tumor will see 64% of the maximum dose. Okay, not good, but I can survive. For proton, let's say for 125 mV proton beam, for this case, tumor sees 100% of the maximum dose. If something not unanticipated is on the way, you need to pull this PDD by 1 cm, now some part of your tumor sees 0% of the maximum dose. So this is not good. And that's why knowing material information as accurately as possible is very important for proton. Uh, so how do we uh, obtain that material information? Uh, current state of the art is uh, what's known as stoichiometric calibration to go from a CTHU to SPR. But as we said, it has some uncertainty and simply because HUs themselves have, have uh, uncertainty because of the design of the scanner, size of the scan object, location of that object within volume of your scan and then beam, KVP and MAS. Calibration process will introduce some uncertainty. And as a result, your stopping power ratio will have some uncertainty. So instead of doing this type of conversion or calibration, it would be nice to measure SPR directly. And PRG and PCT kind of promise that. So that's kind of a motivation why people are chasing after this. So you get your protons, you have your object that you want to image, you transmit protons through that object. The goal is to arrive at a set of values of water equivalent path length or weapons, and sometimes they are used as wet or water equivalent thickness. The energy loss of each proton is the primary mechanism for contrast. So 
So initial energy of the proton at the other end is the final energy of the proton. So that gives you that WET in that uh, path. Remember, this is dictated by ionizations and excitations as we see in that complicated best block equation slide. And because of the stochastic nature of charged particles, there will be statistical variations in energy. We call this energy straggling on top of, uh, and kind of tied to that is the range straggling. So the stopping depth for any particular proton will exhibit statistical variation owing to the variation in cumulative energy loss. So this is kind of intimately connected with that energy straggling. So uncertainty here can be decreased um, uh, by increasing the energy, but what, what, I'm sorry, by increasing the number of protons, but what will that do uh, if you increase the number of protons, that will increase the uh, imaging dose. So that's also not very desirable. So regardless of your detector technology, that inherent due to the nature of the protons, about one CM uncertainty in the range is always there. So that's why uh, it's kind of uh, not easy to image with the proton. So question number four, in the context of transmission proton imaging, how high of proton energies are we talking about? 250 MeV, 100 MeV, 50 MeV, and 6 MeV. Okay, so majority agrees that it's a 250 MeV. I like it. Um, so to give you an idea of uh, range of proton in water is uh, 450 MeV, 15.77, about 16 cm. For 250 MeV, it's about 38 cm. So if, if you want to image anything thicker than 38 cm, sometimes it might be the case. Oftentimes it's not. You might even need even more energy than 250 MeV. Uh, 6 MeV protons and 50 MeV protons, this will have a sub cm range, and this will have, I don't know, 3 to 4 cm range. So not very good. You don't get any signal on the other side of the things that you're trying to image. So uh, two approaches in the uh, imaging, the proton tracking approach and proton integrating approach. So we said the proton transmission radiograph can be obtained by directing the proton beam through an object on a suitable sensor, right? The passage of the proton is detect detected indirectly, typically exploiting the energy trans transfer energy by ionization and excitation. So what does the tracking approach do? The proton tracking in radiography or CT uh, consists of number of position sensitive detector modules to infer the proton path, typically between one and four. They also have something known as residual energy range detector to determine the residual energy of the exiting proton. What does the integrating approach do? The definition of proton integrating technology is that the signal in each pixel is due to the passage of undetermined number of incident protons. And the resulting signal will depend on both proton fluence and the energy distribution. But in proton integrating radiography, it assumes that that signal can be calibrated to the average proton WET through the patient. So this figure here kind of uh, summarizes um, different setups to achieve uh, proton uh, radiography and uh, if this doesn't make sense, probably it doesn't. Let me try to give you an example. So here is a setup, uh, example setup. Here we have a CIRS uh, motion phantom that we want to image, and uh, we shoot 240 MeV through this uh, of a different field size, as you can see, anything from 5.5 .5 to 30 by 30 field. And we use an amorphous uh, silicon uh, flat panel imager uh, in the frame mode and then there are you know, different type of uh, tumors or something that we want to see. Uh, the purpose was to show that the proposed system, something like this, was uh, good enough for uh, treatment verification of both stationary and we moved this at the same time too, and uh, uh, moving targets in the lung. So what is the limitation of the integrating approach? Um, the main uh, problem is, uh, again, uh, the degradation in the spatial resolution and it really depends on the patient anatomy and the detector patient geometry. So 
this work by Fico and Dippo show this really well. They radiographed uh, a pen tip and a screw with a radiochromic fill and a different, uh, another different uh, detector. And the only thing they change is the uh, air gap offset. And just by changing that, you can see the image quality degrades a lot due to multiple Coulomb scattering and creating this kind of halo effect at the material interfaces. So that's the kind of a problem. What about uh, the cracking approach? And this study by Schneider et al. was possibly one of the earlier studies. They used uh, 214 MeV uh, energy. They used a pair of hodoscopes to track uh, patient, a proton position. And a hodoscope is a position sensitive scintillating fiber. Um, that their field size was 20 by 20. Uh, and uh, proton radiography was acquired in 20 seconds. This is long compared to photon radiography, like a blink of an eye, mainly due to time it takes to scan that 20 by 20 field with a pencil beam. So they estimated the dose of 0.03 milligray. Note that this is 50 to 100 times smaller than that of an X-ray image. And the spatial resolution they could obtain with that system in early days, 2000, was 7 millimeters. Another study by uh, Sarosiak, uh, they developed and characterized prototype that could be integrated in the clinic. They tried different inserts in the CIRS phantom, pediatric phantom. Uh, of course, the WETs of their, they are known. They were able to measure uh, the WET of those inserts by uh, 0.2 millimeter accuracy, and they obtained uh, one line per millimeter range of uh, spatial resolution. Okay, and the last section is about proton computer tomography. This kind of, I tried to put this to illustrate what that kind of entail. So what we're trying to do is let this be a pencil beam and let this be some object that you're trying to image. You pass your pencil beams through this object and one way to do this is that you kind of measure the residual energy of each proton. Remember proton tracking. And then once you do that, then you have your WET. And that will depend on the range difference of, between uh, the entering proton and exiting proton. This, in theory, should give you the uh, RSP of this voxelized object where X is uh, the pass length of the proton in that object. So you kind of build this uh, matrix the goal is to determine the RSP matrix. We measure the WET and X matrix of path length of proton. So the quality of your image here will depend on how accurate is your WET measurement and how accurate your X matrix and what reconstruction te technique you use. Primitively, one can assume that the proton just passed through this straight path. But this is not true. If you remember the multiple Coulomb scattering, it will have this tortuous kind of path and we need to determine the most likely path of protons. Uh, there are some investigations about this by different groups, but the path will be obviously affected by this multiple Coulomb scattering. So can we mitigate this? Of course we can. We can increase the energy of the proton so that it doesn't do this motion, but then you can appreciate that it will come to you at a reduced contrast because now the entering energy and exiting energy will be very close to each other. So the contrast of the proton image comes from the energy loss. So if you don't have a lot of energy loss, the contrast will be not good. Um, and accurate determination of this most likely path will affect your spatial resolution. And uh, this path is not straight. And this obviously violates the assumptions and reconstruction of uh, tomography. What can you do? You can mm, apply to suboptimal approaches to apply some cuts, not to take this, but just take the protons that are very close to the straight path, but that will lose in a lot of signal. So here, an example of proton commuted tomography. Uh, they use 160 MeV protons. Their detector was gadolinium oxysulfide. They used FTK as a reconstruction algorithm and could get 0.1 line per millimeter spatial resolution. Keep in mind that the X-ray CT spatial resolution is one line uh, pairs per millimeter. So it's really not very good 
special uh, resolution. And this one, this work is by uh, Zygmansky. It's a kind of a proton CBCT. And one of the latest and closest to be deemed clinically ready for uh, uh, prototypes is from Loma Linda and the UC Santa Cruz collaboration. They used 200 MeV protons packing detector. Uh, and the range detector is just a scintillator. They also used FTK as a reconstruction algorithm, and they were able to achieve 0.6 line pairs per millimeter. So kind of this approaching X-ray uh, CT. So I think this is one of my last slides. So for proton uh, computer tomography, there are two prototypes that are close to being clinical. The first one is the prototype from collaboration of Loma Linda and Santa Cruz. The other one is the collaboration of North, Northern Illinois Inst uh, University and Fermilab. Um, so the, that's A. And for B, the, some proton clinics do not have high energy for transmission energy, so transmission imaging. So they will have, I don't know, 70, 100, but not good enough to image big things. Some proton clinics have only fixed beam. And keep in mind, this points B and C are not fundamental problems. We can achieve higher energies, and we can achieve, even, even if you have fixed beam, you can rotate the objects that you want to uh, image. And then E is proton radiography, probably going to be clinical, uh, in clinical use soon. Uh, and the primary motivation is range verification and IGRT. Uh, and there is a new uh, kind of a research or new uh, type of subfield emerging called proton counting uh, radiography and uh, computer tomography. It's getting some attention. Uh, yeah, let's see what happens to this in 10 years. And AI can be used, obviously, to improve the image quality of bad image quality proton images. And let's see what that will bring to the field as well. So I think I'll conclude this talk, uh, this lecture. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm ready, uh, happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sardar. Very nice lecture. Uh, we lear learned a lot here. Um, I will ask a question more about Mavion S250 FIT system. Obviously, there's a big cost associated with the conventional proton systems like the Mayo you showed, you can buy around 200 Linux, right? Regular ones, um, instead of this big proton system that can only treat in four volts. So um, yeah. what's the cost associated with uh, 250 fit? And what do you see the benefits and drawbacks of the system that we are getting? Yeah, most uh, proton centers uh, probably will not make money. Uh, it will offer a another item or kind of uh, a tool or weapon, if you will, uh, in the arsenal of what you have already have. Uh, so yeah, you said like a four gantry room probably will treat at maximum 100, 120 patients a day. Uh, uh, for, 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 so what what uh, is uh, that going uh, going from that gantry room to uh, the fixed uh, beam line plus the uh, upright position like what we're trying to get? The first thing is you don't have to build a new vault. So most of that cost that comes with uh, the proton center, uh, maybe half, a little over half goes to the the, the building, you know, it's all of those vaults are shielded. The cyclotron room is shielded. So you'll be pouring a lot of concrete. Um, so if you can promise people that you can fit uh, your proton system into an existing LINAC vault, so probably that's uh, a lot of saving from the get-go. Uh, and then it really depends on the efficiency of how many patients you can treat uh, with that uh, uh, upright positioner uh, probably because it will also be your simulation platform as well. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, but in terms of technical benefits or drawbacks? Oh, technical benefits and drawbacks. So uh, in terms of the technical